second welcome, a big welcome from Australia. And actually, I, I start to see a no, number of the names pop up, and there's a very broad spread of people all over the world. We've got Sweden, we have a couple of places in Asia and New Zealand. So it's a, a worldwide webinar this morning. So uh, a big ASCMA welcome to you, Frank Rossi. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Um, can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, it would have been nice to meet you in person. Uh, last time I was there, uh, it was different leadership of the organization, and the organization had a different name. And uh, kudos on a big move to change the name. Uh, I took great notice in that uh, early on. So uh, hopefully that continues to help you uh, throughout the country. And, and certainly for us in our country, one of the things we've learned uh, about the business of what we do is, is that it's really important that we do have some sort of united effort when it comes to these sorts of crisis situations. Uh, I can tell you that the leadership of our major organizations throughout this thing uh, have tried really hard, I think, to provide reason leadership. Everybody was scrambling around pretty frantically for a while. But anyway, uh, it's just, just a note about the importance of association and thank you all for taking the time to support your association. Uh, I wish I could be down there to be enjoying your winter time. Uh, it's about 32, 33, 33 degrees C uh, up here right now. So it's nice and summertime for us, longest day of the year. I'll be happy to get back outside and, and take a dip in the pool uh, before I head off to bed tonight. So a big warm welcome from me. And uh, I don't want to waste another minute uh, other than to say, if you do have a burning question, uh, feel free to raise your hand or throw it in the chat box, Simone and Mark. Uh, we'll be watching that. So let me go right to the visuals that I prepared uh, for our time together today. And I, you know, I have to say, and I, I'm a lifelong educator. I, I'm at my academic life 30 years now, 24 here at Cornell, uh, six at two other really fine institutions, Michigan State at the, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I can tell you, I've never had a more teachable moment to talk to people about data. We are inundated with data in this country regarding uh, the epidemic and the pandemic and the infections and the deaths and the curves. and the. So I'm trying to capitalize a little bit of what I'm seeing in this country, pivot to maybe what I would have done if I saw you in person, and talk a little bit about some of the research that we're using, doing and how you can use some of that data to make your golf turf operation and your sports turf operation a little bit more precise a little bit more efficient and satisfy your customers a little bit better. And so uh, some of this is from some thinking I've been developing over the last several years with regard to, you know, what is data? You know, what data do I need? Well, I can get weather data every day. I can take a stint meter reading every day. I can get a Klagenhammer reading every day. Is that the data I need? Well, I think it depends on what are you going to do with it? You're going to top dress differently. You're going to wear different shoes. You're going to water differently. And then how's that going to make me better? Does looking, at a, does looking at a number make me better at doing something? Listen, I grew up with the touchy-feely guys. All the guy put, put the core in the ground, feel, ooh, it's got the right amount of moisture. That's how they determine the way to water. And I'm not suggesting that that still can't be done, but you would find very few places where a moisture meter isn't used. You find very few places where you ask a guy, oh, what's your number? And they can tell you exactly the moisture meter number that they use on those greens to get through a day, to make sure it's got the firmness, uh, and so on. So obviously it's clear this is not something revolutionary. So data are, data are facts and statistics that we collect to refer to. Well, how do we know it's dry? Well, the soil moisture is 8%. Well, how do we know it's wet? Well, look at our rainfall meter. It said we got 25 millimeters, right? Well, what do I do with it? Well, I can adjust. I got 25 millimeters. Maybe I shouldn't spray fairways today, right? I got, uh, it hasn't rained for a while. My wetting agent's on the outside of the interval of when I normally treat it. I don't have it in my irrigation system. I still like to make applications. It's on the outside of it. It's really dry. I better go do something with that now, right? So that's where you're matching up products, soil moisture, climate, all why to manage your water better. And if I learned anything from the times I've been there, I refer oftentimes to the way you as a country, as a, a, a people who manage the land there, 
are so much better water managers than I see really anywhere else in the United States. But, but the, I mean, our desert Southwest guys are pretty good, but I can tell you, everybody gets lazy if they're not restricted and they're not paying. I have found that pretty quick, even in the desert where they'll use a billion gallons of water, uh, oversee uh, 500 acres of ground, uh, and not think twice about the way some places are watered. So I've always admired that about you guys, and I know that some of it has to do with the data that you use to manage it. All right. Now, I'm an educator and a researcher, so I live in this world. I don't understand the world without numbers. I realized in the pandemic, being locked up with my family, I prefer numbers to people on a pretty regular basis. I'd much rather be around numbers and deal with numbers on a regular basis than be locked up with my family as much as I love them. Uh, we didn't go anywhere for the better part of three months here in New York State. Uh, so um, I really learned about sort of dealing with my staff and my people, my family on a pretty intense basis. And it made me really enjoy why I like to use numbers all the time. What do I use them for? It tells me what happened. It helps me understand why something did happen. Right. And then I'm using it all the time to give talks like this and say, well, listen, if this happens and that happens, you can bet that's going to happen. In fact, it's got an 80% chance of happening. So you go from, hindsight to foresight by looking at numbers. Now, I'm a huge baseball fan. I, I miss baseball uh, more than anything. I, I can't bring myself to watch golf right now, uh, but I certainly miss baseball. And what I've watched happen to the sport I love is completely being transformed by data, completely being transformed. The workforce is going to be transformed by data. The way we watch baseball is being transformed by data. We've learned that if you can analyze the data properly for what your goals are, you don't have to pay as much for a player. You can make a shift and bet that player can't beat you because they can't figure out how to hit when you've got everybody on the side they always hit on. So data is transforming sports and our industry is not going to be any different. None of us are trained to be data scientists. We don't look like this person. We generally don't walk around like this person on the golf course on a regular day, but you certainly have to have the ability to look at your data and understand what it's trying to tell you. <laughs> I did watch this knucklehead <laughs> the other day on television. Uh, and this guy is Bryson DeChambeau is completely data driven. I don't think he's necessarily data driven when it comes to pace of play. But if you look at what this young man just did to himself, by putting on weight, he increased his distance almost 30 yards in a single three-year period, right? Look at his max ball speed. Look at his club head speed because they figured out in golf, the faster you swing, even if you hit it sort of crooked, the ball will go further and you'll score better. It's what's happening to golf. This is completely changing the way we look at the game than the, the courses that we manage. Right now, this is the biggest reason you might see a change in the ball. Now, that's a big debate. I have, you need Jack Fry to come and talk to have that kind of a debate about the game and the ball. But for sure, what's happening is the game is being data-driven. The players who use our golf course are cooking these little nubs at the end of their clubs and tracking every single shot they take. And they're getting these reports about how their game is going. Now, I can tell you, not the older people. And in Australia, you have a high percentage of people in Australia over the age of 65 that play most of the golf that you guys cater to in Australia. You have a very high average rate, uh, average player uh, age for most of the rounds being played by right? Younger people that are coming into the game are attracted to being able to use data in the game. And I think if we're not able to talk to them about the data we get from our golf courses, or if we can't talk to athletes who want to play on our fields about the data with regard to those fields, how hard they are, what the traction is, how do the shoes test on this particular field? What's the soil moisture reading? What was the ball roll? What was the trueness, right? 
if they're going to talk to us about their performance, they're certainly going to want to know about the performance of our surfaces. Now, you pretty much see this at tournaments and major events, but I'm suggesting it should be in every aspect of our management, even in the smaller, what we would call mom and pop places, because data can be relatively easy to come by. Now, the AFL for the sports turf managers that are joining us today, um, as well as the golf turf managers uh, joining us today, you know, have been looking at this kind of safety data for a really long time. This is some data that I generated uh, working with the AFL when they came here for some exhibition a number of years ago in New York, and we really couldn't find a suitable playing surface for them. None of the data revealed that these were good surfaces. And I can tell you, this is not done in my country. You, it's, the NFL is just starting to do it. The NFL and some of soccer, uh, the MLS is starting to do. We're not seeing widespread data use on playing surfaces in the United States of America. We're certainly behind the times relative to you guys and the benchmarking that I know Doug Lindy's worked on uh, across the pond there in New Zealand. Now, what kind of data do we have? Everybody's looking at these things. They know exactly what they are. Stint meter, moisture meter, clag hammer, true firm. We know what it is. What do I do with it? I might water different. I might roll again. I might lower my height of cut. I might raise my height of cut. I might decide, do I need a top dressing today? Will that make it firmer? We have this data. We've had stint meter reading data forever. You know what we did with it? We cut the, we cut the grass lower. When we killed all the grass after cutting it too low from anthracnose, we realized we needed to top dress it a little bit more. So we started top dressing. We started getting less anthracnose. We started giving it more nitrogen. And then we realized there was no end to how much we could roll it. I don't think I've been to a place where I would ever say to them, I think you're rolling too much. I haven't been to a place where I could say to someone, I think you're rolling too much yet, unless they're killing some of the surrounds. And then I'd say, well, maybe you need to roll differently, but I wouldn't tell them to stop rolling. I've yet to find a negative impact of rolling uh, every day, particularly on our bent pole putting surfaces. Now, here's the problem with data. Here's the problem with data. It can be used to confuse and mislead us. So I want to start out with what I've been harping about for many, many years. Uh, better part of 25 years, I've been saying the same thing about soil nutrient testing. <laughs> Fake news travels six times faster than the truth on Twitter. How about that? I'm sure that's not surprising to anyone. And I would tell you, we have a fair amount of data now over the last 20 years of surveying our country. That soil nutrient testing data has been partly responsible for the chronic overfeeding of our modern turf grass systems. I don't care if it's a sports field or a golf course. I'm fairly sure we've been over fertilizing our turf for almost in my entire career. Almost my entire career. And it's because of a form like you're looking at in front of you. Let me see if I can grab a pen here and see if I can make this work. How about that? All right. Here's potassium. All right. Here's potassium. Oh, sorry, my hand's not so steady. And it says 53 part per million. And the way this thing rates something like that, it says very low. It says potassium's very low. Now, this was the kind of baloney. This is a brand new soil test. But this is the kind of baloney that they've been doing for 30 years with potassium testing, right? That interpretation telling you it's very low, even when you look at your grass and it looks perfectly fine, because that number says it's low, you add potassium every single time. And so consequently, <laughs> most people, if they use soil nutrient testing, and our GCSA survey over the years shows this clearly, people who soil test on a regular basis regularly apply more nutrients. And people say, well, of course, because you need more. Bah, no, there's no evidence that you actually need more. How do we know this? We know this. Because now we've been looking at these minimum levels that Larry Stoll and Michael Woods developed 10 years ago, eight years ago now, based on a wide range of soil testing from really good turf, independent of the species, independent of the soil type. If you're not using these kinds of minimum levels to interpret your soil nutrient testing, I promise you, you're over fertilizing. And you may say, well, so what? Okay. Well, if it, if it doesn't matter that, you know, some guys say in the, you know, in the New York metropolitan area where golf's a big deal, they say, Frank, I, I don't get paid the same money necessarily. 
I get paid to give them a good golf course. I don't have to worry about this if I put it on. And I'm here to tell you, you don't have to worry about it even if you don't put it on. Most of the time, you're rarely going to see these kinds of deficiencies be a big deal. So how does your turf look and perform? A grad student here from Cornell, one of my former students, Doug Soldat, who I, I don't know if he's made the trip to Australia yet, but you'll hear me refer to his work a lot. He's working in Wisconsin with someone who, who is a legacy of Wayne Cousseau, who I got to work with when I was there. And we began to ask the question, why are we adding nutrients if the turf looks good, even though the number says it's low? Well, eventually, if you don't put phosphorus on the sand-based putting green for bent grass, it starts to turn purple. And then as soon as you do start to put phosphorus on there, here it is at three to four part per million. There it is at five. And then as soon as you get to seven, it looks perfect. 11, 17, it doesn't get any better looking. The more you add, once you get to that critical level, you've got enough. So this is one way of using data to say, okay, that's a hard number. I got to get to this number and stop. Now, I don't know if it's seven for you. This is seven on Bankgrass in Wisconsin. But I promise you, if you start to see your turf turning purple, it's not going to die. All you got to do is put some phosphorus and it will regrow. A turf like this won't even respond to nitrogen if you put it on. So what does this mean? Why is this good? We've started mapping soils on a pretty wide scale basis here on our uh, state park golf project. Uh, the project that built, we built out of the Beth Page State Park for many, many years ago. One of the things we focused on in that project was nutrient management. And one of the things we've added to the study of these 15 other golf courses now that are using the same sort of protocol we developed at Beth Page is we've begun to map the large areas of soil on the fairways and in the immediate rough surrounds, T, T surrounds, large areas that we fertilize. We still fertilize these large areas. So we've started to map them and get their soil test levels, right? We, we start to get their soil test levels. So we soil test, we map, we pull samples, we use the web soil survey to determine what our numbers are, and then we run it through some sort of interpretation. If we use the old-fashioned sufficiency level that's been used in that previous uh, slide I showed you, we'd probably treat about 70% of this fairway with phosphorus. And if we didn't have a GPS sprayer or a GPS-guided spreader, I'd probably treat the whole fairway, right? But if I analyze that same nutrient number using the MLSN approach and my turf looks good, I don't put on any fertilizer. Lo and behold, data used properly can save money and resources. And that same data has been used to sell an awful lot of fertilizer most people didn't need. Potassium is another good example of this. This is some work that Lindsay Hoffman did many years ago on perennial ryegrass sports turf. You always hear you got to add more potassium to get more traffic tolerance. It's a pretty good mantra that we hear pretty regularly here in the United States. And so what you're looking at here is two weeks after wear, four weeks after wear, eight weeks after wear at three different potassium rates. In fact, you can see as you added potassium in the first couple of weeks after the traffic started to be applied, the more potassium you added, the less recovery you got. So what about the N to K ratios on wear tolerance? Here's a good number to use. Instead of just using a soil test number, what is my nitrogen to potassium ratio? And how does it relate to what I want? Well, I want more wear tolerant turf. So it looks like I'm at a, what is this? A one to 0.2? one part N, 0.2 parts K, a five to one ratio to get maximum wear tolerance on perennial ryegrass. Now, is that ideal for you? I don't know, but I know by looking at this data, I might think about the way I fertilize my sports turf a little bit differently. Now, what do we know and how do you use data to compare yourself? Now, I don't know what's happening in Australia and I don't know what kind of pressures you guys are under from a nutrient perspective. But back here in the States, we're under a lot of pressure now for nutrients because we see them persisting in the environment. Unlike pesticides, in fact, that are breaking down, nutrients are persisting. We're applying them and they're potentially moving. them. So there's been a great interest in looking at our overall national reduction in the use of nitrogen and we use fertilizer use, and we're looking at how we're doing. So this is some work that was done by the GCSAA. Uh, over the last several years, looking at nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium use. 
that's occurred between 2006 and 2014. And then how did that occur? Well, a couple of places closed. A lot of places didn't treat as much acreage after the crash in 08, 09. But more places just reduced the rate. Why did they do it? Because they started to look at the soil test differently. They held back the fertilizer and they noticed, you know, my turf doesn't look any different. My turf doesn't look any different. Maybe I didn't need that nutrient, right? Maybe I didn't need that nutrient. So I think by using data and comparing yourself to what's happening around your region, uh, your fellow superintendents, it would be nice if there was a database of this that we could refer to uh, over time. Uh, but generally, it's good to use for this purpose. Now, here's what we've been doing on our state parks. We did a project many years ago. I talked about it in 2012 when I got there looking at pesticide, managing a golf course without pesticide use on the putting greens. And the other thing I was sneaking in the back door was how do I manage a putting green by just putting on nitrogen, iron, and primo? That was it. It was the only nutrients we added for about eight or nine years until we finally got to the point where it looked like we needed to add some potassium. And now we're in about a 1 to 0.5 N to K ratio on an annual basis for the bent poa greens there. Now, look at what's happened in the other 15 golf courses we've been monitoring. This is a five-year period over in, in, on those three golf courses. We're seeing dramatic reductions uh, continued in the amount of nutrients that we're using. Fairway fertilizer use in the biggest way, right? This is a big deal. These large applications on these large areas is where both the cost is, the labor is, and the potential off-site movement can be. All right. Well, Dr. Rossi, <laughs> I thought data-driven nutrient management meant I had the soil test. So if it's not based on soil test, what's it based on? And of course, this picture here to the left, supplied by a uh, golf course superintendent in the state of Washington here in the U.S., uh, Sean Rehorn, uh, is clipping volume. Now, I wish we had a way of uh, taking a poll of hands for those of you that are actively doing this, because I'm going to give you a little spiel about why I think this is important data, why I think it's not just important for golf, but I also think it's important for sports turf. And what it's allowed us to do during this pandemic, especially on our sports fields that are not getting actively used, we have no organized sports underway in the United States of America right now. A few youth sports are starting up. Some of the sports are starting up, but kids are getting infected and they're shutting them down. So being able to manage growth, being able to measure clipping volume, being able to know how to use nitrogen and growth regulators properly has allowed the staff to dial the fertility of the sports fields down. We've got labor now on the sports fields at 30 to 40% of what we'd normally be because nobody's using them and we don't even need to cut them. So we have really a nice ability to dial in what we want. And I think this is the closest I've seen us come in my career to being able to dial in our golf turf management for performance. All right. Clipping volume. You can shoot, shoot, you know, the hashtag clip volume on Twitter is a great way to learn this. My pal, Michael Woods uh, has written a little uh, fact sheet booklet on this. I'd encourage you to go to his place and download it. Uh, here's Paul Robertson's place to Victoria golf, club in, uh, Vancour in Victoria Island, British Columbia, uh, how to collect, uh, you know, fancy ways to do it, grading the buckets. Smart guys have thought of 50 different reasons not to do this. And I bet you there's more than that. But I can tell you really smart guys have figured out how to do make it take no time at all and use it to slowly transform their entire operation. Well, where did it start for us? We had one of those uh, tough-minded golf course superintendents here on the Cornell Golf Course. And we said, hey, we want to collect data on a golf course. Oh, we got the normal spiel. It's too much of a hassle. First day we did it, we collected from the different buckets. And look what we found. Oh, boy. I guess we got to go back to the shop and make sure the head's all cut right. This is a triplex. Collected the clippings from the three heads and saw this happen. Now, I can tell you, too, sometimes one bucket's bigger than the other because of a cleanup pass. So you have to watch out for that. But a lot of times, let's just say the um, equipment manager has needed a lot of help with setting the reels over the years here at the Cornell Golf Course. But this is a nice little check 
uh, one way to start. This was the first day we tried and we won the superintendent over immediately by showing him this data. Now, this is what the data looks like over the course of a year. You're looking at the big black bars being precipitation. So that's when it rains, right? It's when it rains. The blue line is a shaded, mostly annual blue grass, a little bit of velvet bent grass, a little bit of creeping bent grass, uh, shaded green in a tucked area, probably one of the slower growing greens, and an almost pure bent grass green in the wide open with no limitations to growth at the fifth and the seventh green. Oh, we're only collecting on two greens. I know people that collect six greens, three greens, eight greens. We've added some putting greens. Now our superintendent is actively looking at this data saying, oh, mowed the putting green, oh, roll today. Mowed the putting green, oh, uh, yeah, no, no cut, no roll today. They're, if they're getting the performance they want with the growth they want, they're using it to completely change what they're doing. Now, if you look at this data with any sort of close eye, you see generally, generally, not always, but generally, and if it was always, it would be a lot easier. You generally will see after a rain event, a slight uptick in growth on both greens, right? A little bit of rain here, quite a bit of rain, a slight uptick in growth. There's a little bit of a lag effect. You could see growth was going down, but a slight uptick. Now, I'll just remind you, we apply plant growth regulators using the Greenkeeper app on a strict growing degree day basis. So this is with uniform PGR use applied at very precise frequencies according to the PGR rates and frequencies that we use based on our local weather station. Now this green bar in the middle in here, we figured out that this bar is where we really want our clipping yield for maximum performance, how the ball rolls, how firm they are, the way they hold the shot. In 2018, now we've got another year in 2019. Early on, one of the things we realized was that, boy, the soil's got a lot of nitrogen in it. And when it rains, the nitrogen breaks down in the organic matter and releases. And even the PGR doesn't hold it back. That might be when I see rain coming and I know I've got to make a PGR application based on my frequency. And we use the Greenkeeper app to track it for us right? I might go at a higher rate because my growth rate's going to be higher, right? You change basically the length of uh, uh, regulation, the depth of regulation with the rate, and the length of regulation is based on the frequency of application that Bill's pretty much established across the board. Now, I'm sure this has to be modified a little bit in Australia, but I got to tell you, if you go to the Greenkeeper app, they got tons of models for all the grasses and the mowing heights, that are out there. And that's what we're using this data for. And this is Bill's thinking on it. Bill was my graduate student for three years. He came and took a, a, a you know, he came and taught me about things I didn't know about. It's the great reason for having great students like Bill. If you look at the way you're trying to grow an athletic field, a fairway, a T, right? You know, you, you, you put on the accelerator pedal when you put nitrogen in, right? You're putting a brake on with the PGR. And then there's the sort of uncontrolled or different gears you're in based on the growing conditions. How much light? How much water? What's the soil moisture? What's the temperature? What's the growth potential? All those other factors, right, are going to determine growth rate, right? And so what we're learning is in areas where you need to push the pedal down because there's greater traffic, right? You have to either moderate your PGR rate, increase your nitrogen rate, right? We're seeing some people start to do this now, right? But ultimately, you start this conversation by collecting clipping data. Now, we use the Greenkeeper app. I'm sure there are other ones that are out there. This is the best one on the market for looking at all the ways we regulate turf because not only are PGRs, but if you're using DMI fungicides, if you're using pre-emergent herbicides, those are all plant growth regulators. If you're not tracking them using some app like this to tell you how much regulation you got, that's why you get collar decline, right? I mean, Bill's really honed in on why collars decline around certain surfaces when they're treated at the same PGR rate as a putting green. And the answer is because they don't grow as much and they get over-regulated. 
And there's a lot of suspicion that we're over-regulating our turf a lot more than we know sometimes. And you'd know that if you tracked your clippings more closely. Now, some people say, well, oh, yeah, how much is in the bucket? I find out how much is in the bucket. And my program manager, my colleague, uh, Carl Scamenti, who's a golfer, says, yeah, asking somebody what's in the bucket is, is like looking at the hole and say, yeah, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's 150, 200 yards, somewhere in there. Versus a range finder, knowing where the pin is, that's what clipping volume is. Clipping volume is your range finder for getting more precise in targeting your growth. And using apps like this is a way to get your PGRs in line. We've been able to develop ideal tournament conditions for our growth rates on these putting greens. We have a big state uh, golf tournament every year at this time, so we can track our growth rate during that time. And we also know that when we're getting 200, 300 rounds a day, and now we're getting five sums with five carts because we've decided you can't put two people in a cart. Five people go out. All of a sudden, I need more growth. And I need more growth in my fairways where the carts are going. You could look at cart tracking data now. You cannot see the turf anymore because cart traffic has been so intense during the pandemic. Okay. Now, Here's something very interesting that's part of our research with our state park golf courses uh, and our work with the organic golf course out at the Vineyard Golf Club in Martha's Vineyard. This is a golf course that cannot use synthetic pesticides and they can't use growth regulators. So if you look at this green line, right, this is the clipping, clippings from their primarily A1, A4 bent grass greens during the summer months. And it becomes very, very difficult to get excellent playing conditions without putting out enormous amounts of sand, rolling, rolling to the point where you're wearing out the collars and the surrounds because the growth on this golf course is so severe. They've primarily been using organic fertilizers for the last 15 years and now when it rains, and they're not using growth regulators, that grass just grows. There's so much organic matter there, that grass just grows. So this is a good indication of what happens when you don't get control over your growth. You've got to do a lot of other things to get that playability that you're looking for. All right, let me get, I think I'm almost ready to take a break here and see if there's any questions. Now, before I wrap up here, I got two more slides and then we'll, uh, if you got questions, you can start chewing on them now. We'll take a break and I'll get a drink. I'm working up a pretty good sweat here. It's nice and warm. It's so nice to be sweating. Michael Woods, another one, you know, you're going to hear me quote Michael a lot. Love that he keeps asking these questions. But he's starting to link growth, clipping volume, and measuring organic matter, right? to nutrient management. How do I, what kind of organic matter levels do I need and how do I manage my nutrients? So we started out looking at organic matter on our state park golf courses. So we have these number of golf courses, A through N, we leave, the, we leave the names of them out. So we've started to mine some of this data that we've been collecting from the soil tests on these golf courses over the last several years. And you can see some of them have enormously high amounts of organic matter Many of them have very low amounts of organic matter. Well, we looked at a correlation. It's a very interesting correlation. And I don't know it's entirely related to this. But we actually calculated the golf rounds. Carl Scamenti, my program manager, calculated the number of rounds played per acre of golf course, of playing surface, right? We know greens, tees, fairways, and rough. So how many rounds per acre and how much organic matter do these golf courses have? And you notice that there's a really nice correlation. The lower organic matter numbers are associated with the higher rounds of golf. And the less, the higher organic matter with the lower rounds of golf. So traffic, hmm, what about traffic? Well, Mike is very interested in measuring organic matter at the surface using clipping volume and growth to predict organic matter levels and surface playability. And he's asking questions about what's the best way to sample. We want, we want to know if I get firmer greens, do I have better roll? But as we break here for a minute, let me tell you a story about your championship tees. The tees in the way back of the, 
the, that only five people play maybe three times a year. But somehow, every time the fertilizer rig goes out, it fertilizes that championship tee, even though no one plays on it. I rarely go to a golf course where the championship tee is not like a trampoline, is not like a sponge, right? Is not like, boy, what am I going to do about this organic now? Now, what we've started to do is we take a phrase mower. We've given up on coring and sanding, and we just start phrase mowing the, the organic matter right off, seeding right in, and within 30 to 40 days, I've got a playable golf tee. I don't know why we kill ourselves with this, uh, coring and sanding, when it can be phrase mowed and regrowed pretty quick uh, if you do it at the right time. Now, why am I bringing that up? Because we over-fertilize championship tees. Why are we fertilizing areas that don't get traffic? Why are we fertilizing ground that doesn't get traffic? Well, it's got to look good, okay. But do we keep fertilizing even though it doesn't need it? How much does it need for traffic? And that's the kind of precision we hope to keep getting. And really good scientists like Doug and Micah are leading the way on that. So how about we just take a break here for a minute? It looks like I'm midway. Uh, I will uh, stop sharing. You can look at me. Are there any questions Mark or Simone uh, that have come up in the early part of my presentation. I'm sorry. Any questions at the moment for, for Frank? How about just type them in the chat or something? Can you type them in. Doesn't understand necessarily science. <laughs> so he doesn't see a problem with it. He doesn't see a problem with it at all. I'm going to. Have you left the shed yet? No, Frank. I think you just keep on, keep going. Okay. Here we go. All right. Get to unmute. Okay, you can hear me. Yes, Mark? Yes. Okay. All right. Now, um, Gerald Henry and Chase Straw. Chase was Gerald's graduate student. I had the chance many years ago to have Gerald as a graduate student here at Cornell, but the timing wasn't right. He's moved on to have a wonderful career using data to look at athletic field performance. And these two young men have really done some great work here in the States by adding some precision to the playing surface. Now, why is it important to get some of these athletic field maps? Now, maybe I'm talking to sports turf managers that are actively doing this, but here are the kinds of values you can get from your athletic field maps, watering, wedding agents, PGRs, you name it. What are you doing with performance testing? How do you measure things in a field like a golf course superintendent measures a playing surface? How can you measure these things and link them to player safety? I can tell you, if you listen to my podcast that I did with Andy McNitt and John Sorokin a number of, uh, last year, uh, right in the beginning of our American NFL football season, I a lot of data came out about synthetic turf, a lot of data coming out about footwear, and I had them on my Frankly Speaking podcast, and I put them on the carpet about, hey, what about these numbers and safety? And let me tell you, the owners and the players are running away, shoe manufacturers. Everybody's running away from using the word safety when it comes to playing surfaces and footwear here in the United States. So I think we've got a lot to learn about this still, but there still are many ways to use data to improve the way we manage our sports field. Now, one of the things that's important is that you follow some recognized procedure, right? We have procedures for stint meter readings. We have procedures for firmness readings, right? We have procedures for testing pop dressing materials, right? There's all kinds of standards for testing. Athletic fields, because of their safety uh, requirements, also have performance testing measures and methodology that you should follow. So that's a good place to start. If there's a prescribed way to take the darn data, take the data that way. Otherwise, it's not transferable. You can't talk to somebody about your data if you're not taking it the way they're taking it. So it's really important, especially in athletic field stuff, that we have some uniformity and harmonization about the way we collect data. 
Now, I thought this was the coolest thing that they worked on, where they were able to look at whether they got rainfall or irrigation for the amount of water that the uh, sports field held. And you can do this for a fairway, too. They've adapted this for golf course fairways, too. Here's volumetric water content after a rain event. Here's how uniform the irrigation system is. Here's how firm the surface was at a rainfall, and here's how firm the surface was after an irrigation event. Look at how hard the surface was there versus with it was rainfall. The, the interesting thing about this and what we're finding is these differences, these very fine differences in these little areas here can have very large impacts on player safety and performance. And of course, the more data points you take, the more you learn about this. Now, right now, this isn't as easy as thing to do. You got to go out there and collect this data on this grid basis. And I don't know too many sports turf managers with time on their hands to take this data. But here's what we've done in our sports fields here at Cornell. We've taken this data on a pretty regular basis. We've been able to hire a couple of students, student athletes come to work on my program. We get some uh, alumni to support their internships with us. They regularly collect data. And then during the season, we'll go out and do targeted compaction relief based on some of the hardness data that we're getting. And then we go back and measure that data again. And we see that we're making the surface more uniform. Now, we also do very targeted data. We also do very targeted management in, in the shoulders of the season with the use of covers or pigmented products, particularly in high traffic areas. On a, on a soccer field, we will regularly apply about a, a 50 to 70% more nitrogen in this area right around the penalty box. We will generally have a cover that starts to go on there when soil temperatures get below 10 degrees C. So we have some very targeted management that we do on this field using some data. Now, sometimes <laughs> data is not going to do you any good. So let me tell you a story. This was uh, last winter. Uh, we work with our Division I soccer team here at Cornell University. We've had a pretty good team ranked in the top 25 a couple of times over the last few years. But sometimes you can't protect players from themselves even with data. They called us the morning, uh, two days before the big senior game, and they said, Frank, the field's frozen, there's snow on it, we need to play a senior game. I said, well, let me, you know, let me get my guys out there and get some data. Well, we took the data, and the data was through the roof, and we said, you, you can't play on that field. Well, what about the synthetic field? No, the synthetic field's harder, we told them. The synthetic field was frozen, too. We were, at, we were about minus 10, minus 20 Fahrenheit uh, when this picture was taken. And they wanted to play on a basically a frozen field. And I said, I can't recommend that you play. They said, well, will it help if we get the snow off? I said, yeah, if you get the snow off and the sun comes out, it could help, but I don't think so. Well, they bought a whole bunch of shovels, went out there. We clag hammered. We said, don't play on the field. And they played anyway. So <laughs> sometimes it's good to have data just to tell people, hey, we told you you shouldn't be doing this. You're doing it. Uh, we can't protect you from yourself. And, you know, we obviously have seen this. <laughs> we obviously have seen this in the United States. Uh, people don't want to listen to the data, particularly in, in some parts of our country. And uh, it's costing some people their lives. And that's uh, very unfortunate. And here are those podcasts I was talking about where we talk a lot about uh, the way we've started to interpret this data uh, in the United States. Now, this has been the big push uh, for data in the United States. And I'm telling you, and I don't know how this is happening, and I don't know how much you guys play on synthetic turf over there. But if I can tell you the United States is blanketed in synthetic turf, uh, particularly for uh, football and a lot of the sports uh, throughout the country. And now we've got pretty conclusive data that's showing you have a higher incidence of getting hurt on synthetic turf. And athletes know this now. Many athletes are adjusting their contracts if their team plays on a synthetic turf. So data is beginning to transform these things. And what these guys will tell you, if you listen closely to these podcasts, they're both studying synthetic turf with one purpose in mind. How do we get it to behave like natural turf? What is the primary difference between these surfaces? And the answer is you slip on natural grass. Natural grass will eventually give. 
synthetic turf doesn't seem to have that same give. However, however, it is very much impacted by the footwear. And so both John Sorokin and Andy McNitt are actively testing footwear both for youth sports, and this is what Andy's testing with his machine, the pen foot. John at Tennessee and, and the scientists at University of Virginia are testing Amer uh, large machines, a 300 pound, 130 kilo, yeah, 130 kilo athlete running and planting his foot puts down like a thousand pounds per square inch. It's this enormous amount of pressure that they can create. And you literally want that foot to slip. Otherwise, the injury gets transferred potentially up into the lower leg and lower extremities, right? And so you can find published on the Penn State website the rotational tractional value of each shoe on both a synthetic turf, a bluegrass turf, and a Bermuda grass turf using data to pick footwear, using data based on a playing surface, Measuring performance, you'll notice they'll mention performance, not safety. Now, as I wrap up, let me come back to where my bread is buttered here in the golf turf world. I've been very fortunate here at Cornell University over the last four years to have a partnership with the largest shoe manufacturer, golf shoe manufacturer in the world, uh, FootJoy the number one shoe in golf. We have been doing their field testing uh, of their latest shoes and the ones that they're coming out with now over the last four years. We've started to work on probably something that won't be out for a couple of years. And it's called the Greens Joy Project, designing the next generation of high performance golf, greens friendly golf footwear. And I bring this up because by studying these shoes, much like in the sports turf world, using data to look at footwear, the same way, what can we learn about how a surface performs under traffic? Well, obviously, golf shoes is big business. Uh, people make a lot of money selling golf shoes. Um, and there has been this assertion that basically shows if you have a spike shoe, metal spike in this case, you hit the ball farther. Now, we in, have talked to the scientists who published this work. They were not able to give us their data. They weren't able to share us their data. They said it was proprietary. They say they only use three shoes. So they obviously didn't do a, a extensive testing on this matter. But it does raise the interesting point. What is well known? That if your feet stay stable and you can generate more club speed, you will hit the ball further and score better. That's why they're developing shoes with better traction. Okay, so golf course superintendents took to Twitter and they started bashing golf shoes, banning shoes on golf courses because of the way they looked or what they thought they did. So what we did when we started this work is we asked superintendents, we passed these shoes around several seminars that we gave and we asked superintendents to rank them for what they think the amount of damage will occur. By just looking at the shoe, could they tell how much damage that would occur? Because that's what a lot of them were tweeting out. And so I'll just remind you, the two shoes on the right are spike shoes, and the one on the left, the FootJoy Pro SL, is the spikeless shoe. It's the number one sailing shoe in golf, the shoe with the green bottom. Now, what we found is that golf course superintendents thought the FootJoy DNA 2.0 would be the most damaging. It, in fact, in our studies, field tested the least damaging. Also, the spikeless shoe was rated the least damaging by the superintendent, uh, but the field test said it was sort of average in damage, and the damage ranking uh, for the uh, Under Armour shoe was the most damaging right, by the field test, and they didn't rank that as the most damaging. So it's very interesting. By looking at a shoe, it wasn't always as clear the amount of damage that would occur. Now, we did a lot of research. I had a graduate student looking at this, and we stumbled on early two things. The type of grass you're walking on matters, and the size of the person and the way you walk matters a lot. If you look at the size of these people, 
you can have really large people cause lots of damage and really small people cause no damage. And you find that on certain creeping bent grass putting surfaces, you start to see this grass lifted up. And when you come back, you see some scalping. So we've started to notice that there are some differences that occur on the surfaces. But what was really fascinating to us is what happened with ball roll. First off, if we think golfers can't tell more than six to eight inch, it has to be more than six to eight inches of difference for it to be different actually perceive different uh, a golfer can perceive the difference in the way they play and so we looked at a variety of shoes and if you look closely here you can see we added a spiked shoe and we also have a clubhouse shoe that has really just a nubby tread on it right and this is the amount of difference there was from no traffic so if you look at the line in the middle here that's the ball roll difference. Uh, that's the ball roll distance when there was no traffic. And so when the bar goes up and down, it means it was let it, it slowed the ball down based on no traffic or it sped the ball up based on no traffic. So you got either longer ball roll distance over here, you got longer ball roll distance over here, you got shorter ball roll distance. And you notice that the golf spike with a flat shoe bottom, we generally saw metal spikes increase ball roll distance, especially on saturated conditions. Now, this is very interesting. When you had very wet conditions when we did this study, there's two things that happen. Rolling mattered. In general, if you want to reduce traffic injury, roll more. Ball roll distance, green canopy cover, all the measurements that we made were more pronounced when we didn't roll. Now, the other thing that happens is when you roll, you can tolerate the metal spikes. So here is the metal spike rating. This is the injury rating of the metal spike. And when you don't roll, this is what happens with the metal spike. The other thing we found with the metal spike is it is generally much better when it's wet. When greens get very dry, metal spikes cause more disruption. Metal spikes cause less disruption than plastic spikes and spikeless shoes, as you can see here, right? Under wet conditions when you roll. But when you don't roll metal spikes and you're dry, the metal spikes cause a fair amount of chunking and disruption. Now, as I wrap up, I thought I'd uh, give you the latest that we're learning about using uh, five people uh, who are all different in size and shape, but we all have the same shoe size, nine and a half. And the first thing we realized is no matter what shoe you put on some people, they're going to cause a lot of damage. So you're looking at a 22% reduction in turf quality after 240 rounds applied by person number B, right? You can see that they drop below acceptable quality. Regardless of the shoe, the person mattered most. The other thing that was, again, fascinating is our championship bent grass rolled firmness in the point twos, uh, ball roll distance at 11, 11 and a half. 240 rounds caused very little reduction. The high-end bent POA management where we're rolling, but we're maybe not cutting as low, we're still doing pretty good. And the average bent grass that wasn't rolled, a little bit wetter, a little bit softer, didn't hold up as well. The other thing we noticed is that ball roll reduction was greater on the championship bent grass. So it didn't look bad, but it slowed the ball down more on the championship greens. Now, what about same shoe size, but different fits? There was a suspicion that if people didn't wear the right size, maybe their heel would come out of the shoe and it would cause more damage. Or maybe if their feet were too tight, they would cause more damage. Well, it turned out wider sizes, longer sizes, or proper fit, it didn't matter. Wear the shoe that feels comfortable, it doesn't seem to matter. The other final thing I'll leave you with is that in the golf turf world, we've begun to really see, and this is still a debatable topic that I think we're going to get more about, and I think we're going to see this more in the sports turf world too, 
as we start to dial in the playability and the surface performance, the ball roll we can get on a soccer pitch or on an AFL pitch. When you look at firmness and ball roll or firmness and performance, we generally have seen a firmer surface. Gives us better ball roll, smoother characteristics, holds up the traffic better. And by using that data, we've generally seen our playability and customer satisfaction go up. So as I wrap up, and I apologize for using all my time here, our data-driven management will be the norm soon. I'm hoping, hopefully you're all getting used to it. Hopefully it's going to make your decision making better by laying out options, uh, the risk of something happening, the probability of it being ideal today based on weather conditions and certain, uh, certain parameters. And I hope in the end, the data makes your operation more precise and more efficient for labor and inputs. And I can tell you that's been more important for us recently, uh, especially with the pandemic and the reduced labor force that we've had. Uh, so, um, by being more data-driven, we've seen a lot of these superintendents and sports turf managers to be much more resilient in the face of the craziness that's been going on. So, Mark, thank you very much to you and the board and all of you all for joining me, uh, taking the time. I, I'm very sorry that I couldn't be with you, and hopefully the, the world will allow us uh, to get me down there and, and be with you again. I'm happy to take any questions if you have them um, and hang out a little bit if need be. Thank you very much. Well, Frank, thank you. And we certainly look forward to the day where you can come down and, uh, and be with us all again. I'll just I'll just the microphone. Are any questions for this time? Okay, I think we've got a bit of feedback coming through. So... We've lost, uh, we've lost a little bit of clarity there. So bear with me just a second. Um, Maybe it's best if everybody, if somebody wants to type a question into the chat, did anybody type anything into the chat or the Q and A or, and maybe you're just tired and have had it with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an early start for the guys in WA at the moment. So um, look, if there are any questions as a follow-up to this, uh, feel free to send them through to either myself or to Simone via email. We might collate them, Frank, and send them through to you. And then in your time, it, as it's convenient, we might be able to then uh, respond back to some of those questions if there are things that come up. I, I, will, I, I might ask a question, um, if you don't mind, Frank, in terms of uh, one of the key takeaways. You touched on it in your conclusion there. Um, the key takeaways for me would be if you could recommend one place to start, data-driven decisions are absolutely critical and we see that in pretty much all forms of, of business. Um, where would you start? Where would you recommend is a good place to start? For those who aren't capturing or understanding some of the data as much as uh, potentially you are, where would you recommend that they start? Well, I would say um, every single turfgrass manager should start by looking at data that's easily accessible and they've likely been using already and find a way to tabulate it or, you know, talk to your mates and find out how they do it. And there are plenty of apps uh, on, uh, on, you know, places that can organize these things. And I would say, I would start by saying, you know, having one place where the data is collected. Now, once it's there, what we've done over the years is really encourage people to just look at it. Don't, don't, don't change. Listen, all of you are here because you're probably pretty good at what you're doing. You know, you don't want to say, oh my, look at his data. I should do it. Whoa, whoa. Just look at it. Compare it to what you're seeing and what you're doing. And just notice when you do this or the weather's that, this happens. And try to put a number to it. The key to data working effectively is to know what kind of data you need and then taking it from the yeah, it's, it's this many dumps in the bucket or yeah, it seems this windy today or I got the sweat on my brow or whatever or I feel it and it feels good. To take it from that to a number, a quantitative assessment, is just something that you learn by trial and error and I hate to break it to you. A lot of them are already doing it and it's already part of their thinking process and all I'm saying is, if we bring it together and are more intentional about it, it's going to give us a multiplying effect 
of moving our operation forward because as a lot of people say, if you determine the process of how you want to run something, it's transferable any place you go. You don't need to know the stupid stuff that happens at every property. You can go from property to property, apply a process of collecting data to see how a surface responds and then manage it appropriately. You can go do that somewhere else. It just might be different amounts of things, right? Like I know when I visited Nathan in Adelaide and we were talking organic matter at the time, you know, this was in the early days of, you know, well, what the hell were they doing? Corn, and sanding and screwing it up and what's happening with organic matter. And I think it's just more intentional, reasoned approach, more data-driven approach that I, I recommended to Nathan and we worked through uh, down there, I think has, been, has paid off wild dividends. So pick areas you really want to improve, like firmness of your greens. And the way you do that is by getting the right sand in there and, and not letting it produce organic matter that it doesn't need to produce, right? And, and fertilize based on traffic and know what that means based on growth. So I think the place to start is what you've got uh, that you use already and then work to see to expand it and pick away at the things that matter most. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And we've had a, a couple of questions come up. And I think this is probably a, a pretty pertinent topic because uh, in 2012, you were with us at the Melbourne conference. You talked about the work that you're undertaking at Beth Page. I think it was Beth Page Black. Not, I wasn't there, obviously. Um, but uh, there's a few questions around uh, whether you've started to uh, finalise that data now and have you started pulling cores out of the greens and uh, where's the update? Has the final report landed as yet? Oh, okay. So someone wants to know if we actively pull cores on greens anymore uh, at Beth Page. We, we uh, never published a final, well, we published a final report regarding pesticide and nutrient use, uh, but we never really published a final report regarding organic matter levels. But you saw in my presentation, one of those lettered golf courses was one of the golf courses that we studied initially. And we brought organic matter levels. I think our organic matter levels in the normal way people measure it using the, the sort of uh, undisturbed core approach, the zero to three centimeter uh, uh, percentage. We're in the you know, one and a half to two and a half range uh, everywhere we go. And we haven't pulled the core in 20 years there now. It's, 20, it's 2000, 2020. Once we got a thick enough sand layer, we just kept making holes and, I was on a golf course the other day, has 25-year-old bentgrass greens on sand, and he hasn't pulled the core in 20 years. I hear guys regularly bragging to me about not pulling cores uh, anymore. And, um, you know, I know when I said it there, boy, it, it certainly had a big ripple effect. And, you know, I took a lot of crap here in the country for saying it years and years ago because I said it without actually doing a study myself, only from my observations. And I was interpreting work that had been done by Riki and Murphy and a lot of other people up until that point. Now the definitive work in the last several years has been done by Rock uh, at, at university of Nebraska. And he's talked about this. I'm sure he's been out to the conference talking about this. Uh, basically you got to get the amount of sand into the profile. Organic matter management is, is simply a matter of getting the amount of sand into the profile. In fact, most guys I know have probably eliminated most of their routine cultivation and have gone to things like dry jecting because you can dry jet at different surfaces. This sand injection approach that dry jet offers, not the grading injection, but the dry, uh, dry jet injection. Uh, in America, they're starting to use different sands. We're trying to find ways to incorporate coarser particles. And so guys will make holes and, and put coarser sand in and fill the holes with coarser sand, maybe two, three mil particles uh, in that sand. Um, that's hard to use in some places. Uh, you know, not everybody can have, uh, you know, the beautiful sand belt sands deep and fine that will drain really well. So a lot of guys have started using coarse sands, but I don't know anyone on sand-based greens that routinely pulls hollow tine cores uh, a, 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 on a regular basis and has a good reason for doing it. So let me leave it at that. Uh, I think Maybe that's just going to aggravate people. Or, <laughs> I, I don't really know, but people yeah, like doing these things. things. Looks on the video there. Um, but look, we, we've probably got time for one final question. and It's come through from, from Rob, just in relation to something you mentioned earlier around clipping yield. 
Would there be many courses or, or any research uh, throughout the US that's been undertaken or of commencing uh, around correlating soil temperature measurements with clipping yields? Is that some of the work that's, that you're familiar with? Uh, of course, soil temperature is a component of clipping yield. And I would say the research that's underway, a lot of it by superintendents, but there's a couple of places where it's going as well, where they're trying to build growth models, right? If you, we're at the point now where if you can put your clipping volume in a milliliters per square meter basis, and Doug Soldat's got a, uh, a spreadsheet you can download from his Wisconsin turf grass site. I'd encourage you to go there. All you got to do is put the clipping volume in there, the amount of area, you get a number, right? And so right now, if you can get that number on a regular basis and get, and get weather data, in the, I would say in the next two to three years, it's not going to be difficult for golf courses to have individual growth models based on their location that is going to include but not exclusively soil temperature. In fact, relative humidity tends to be a driving factor. Of course, air temperature, soil moisture, of course, tends to be a driving factor. And in general, early indications from the research I've seen suggests that moisture, soil moisture, is one of the biggest driving factors of growth, bar, anything. So even if you have high soil temperature, but you don't have ideal soil moisture or ideal humidity, you're not always necessarily getting the growth. And so the answer to the question is, yes, this work is going on, and it really is going to be exciting over the next few years. Okay. Lovely. We've got a quick question. So can you give me a 30-second answer on this one? It's I will. Around, uh, your thoughts on ninja times. Ninja times are starting to trend here in Australia. Your thoughts? Uh, Ninja Tines, ah, listen, eh, <laughs> it's hard to give a 30 second answer. I think it, uh, here's how I would decide what to do. I would decide why I needed, I would want to know why I needed a hole. I would need to know how long that hole was going to stay open. And I would want to know um, how much it was going to disrupt God. And I could care less if you called it ninja, sunshine, boo-boo, bomb-bomb. I don't care what you call it. I care about how long the hole stays open, whether the golfer can notice it, and whether I have a targeted reason for doing it. And if ninja tines are what's giving you the benefit of keeping it permeable, but still maintaining good playing surface performance, that's good enough for me. Um, lovely. Appreciate the answer. And I think um, on that note, if there are any further questions, uh, feel free to send them through to Simone or myself. As we said, we'll collate them, send them through to Frank. But uh, I'll also take this opportunity to say thank you to Frank for giving up your time, sharing your expertise. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that um, start somewhere. It, it, Data-driven decisions are absolutely critical. And I think you know, there's a lot of work that's been done over the last couple of years in starting to collect some data on an individual basis. There's probably a very large amount of information there. So again, appreciate the fact that you've given up your time. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of those things that we unfortunately don't get to hear uh, as often as we would like from the experts in the field. So from, your, from Simone, from myself, um, alumni, everybody. So maybe we can offer uh, Frank a bit of a round of applause and thank you for giving up your time. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Hope to see you again soon. Um, everybody else, uh, there's a couple of questions that have come through uh, around a few things. Next week's call is, is Mark Carter on leadership. Registrations are still open for that, so jump onto our website. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and then the second question is around, uh, for those of you who have signed up, and I think there's about 40-odd uh, or so that are on the call, uh, for the certification program. There's no need to do anything for this because the uh, session is hosted by us and registration through us. All of your professional development points will be automatically loaded into your profile. So there is no need to do anything for those that have signed up as part of the uh, Sports Talk Manager certification program. 
So thank you again to Frank. Thank you all for giving up your time uh, and joining us this morning. And hopefully uh, 8.30 next week, we'll see you all again for Mark Carter's session on leadership and development. And Simone's got something to say? And resilience around COVID and leadership. Okay. Thank you all. Have a good day and we'll see you soon. Bye everyone.